Well, good morning. Welcome to 2020. I uh, hope you guys are excited about the new decade. Uh, thank you, Ken and Lena, for sharing your life and how the cross has moved in your life. And thank you for all the small group leaders. It was a great uh, workshop we had to kick off the new year. Um, we're really excited. If you could be turning in your Bibles to the book of Exodus, we're going to be kicking off a whole new series on this right now. And uh, we're going to be learning from it. It's going to be some deep teaching, some fun stuff. And uh, we're going to begin by sharing really the book of Exodus is about a journey you go on. And, you know, we've been here now one solid year, Carrie and I. And Carrie's going to share a little bit about our journey. Yes. Amen. Good morning. Good to be together. Um, okay. Where's Mo Fay when you need him? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, well, it is really awesome to be together. We're so grateful to be here. Um, just to give you a little bit of information about Steve and I, um, I was born and raised in L.A. I was happy to hear Lena was too. I didn't know that about you, Lena, so that's encouraging. Um, and Steve was born in San, An San Antonio, Texas. He um, was a military kid. His dad is a colonel in the Air Force, was, retired now. Um, anyhow, but it's been an incredible journey that God has taken both of us on. Uh, he had become a disciple right out of school. Um, actually, he was a graduating senior when he studied the Bible and became a disciple uh, in 1990. And then I, two years later, um, we didn't know each other then, by the way. That's how we met. Uh, we met at a retreat, and it was the first thing that I had ever come to. And I met him for a very brief moment. Saw him really quickly. I had just ended a three and a half year relationship, so I wasn't looking for a new guy, although he caught my eye. Um, there were a lot of guys there that caught my eye, to be honest. Uh oh. Okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> he remembers, he knows we've had this conversation, but he's the one who won. Okay, there you go. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, anyhow. So when I studied the Bible, I, um, you know, really had no biblical knowledge whatsoever. And so it was the first time for myself reading the scriptures, and I was blown away. And um, funny enough, the thing that really opened my heart was the story of Moses, which is so cool that we're studying the book of Exodus now. Um, but just how, you know, the Old Testament really converted my heart, to be honest, um, and then in studying the Bible more thoroughly, learning about Jesus, um, it was so um, exciting to be able to know that I could be forgiven and have a personal relationship and a connection with Jesus Christ. And so in 1992 is when I got baptized. Um, and interestingly, our church at that time, our fellowship of churches really only allowed the guys to do the baptizing. So I show up at my baptism, this was before cell phones, and uh, the gentlemen that were significant in encouraging my faith weren't at my baptism, not because they didn't want to be, they just never got the message. And uh, yeah, no cell phones, remember that, so it was voicemail, landlines, <laughs> no emails either. Um, so anyhow, Steve was there, he was able to baptize me, which again, God was working, um, and I joked about this with the leaders that he, it was in Manhattan Beach in the ocean, and he held me under the water a lot longer than most people, that people were afraid he was going to drown me, but his hope was to make sure that I was clean when I came up out of that water. Like somehow that was going to make a difference. Um, but anyhow, he let me dry off and he asked me on a date. I did. And of course I said yes. And uh, I, what was it, a year and a half later we were married. And uh, so, yeah, pretty cool. But soon after us getting married, two months later, we were asked to move to South Central Los Angeles. We were living in Long Beach at the time, serving the ministry there, uh, working full-time jobs. And we were asked to move to South Central Los Angeles and help with our church there. And we gladly did that. And so we were there for eight months. And uh, during that time, most people, you know, and I'm sure you all seeing our last name, Lounsbury, you automatically think blonde hair, blue eyed, she grew up in a privileged house. Well, that wasn't the case. Uh, my maiden name is Herrera, so I'm an undercover Latina. And, and so growing up looking like this in not the greatest of neighborhoods, I got a lot of flack. 
And so I had to learn to be tough. I had to learn how to fight physically, literally. Um, many times I would get uh, told by other girls that they were going to beat me up, basically, because they didn't like the way I looked. Well, I couldn't change that. <laughs> so obviously I had to learn how to fight pretty quickly. Um, so we were tough. Going into South Central Los Angeles, I thought, no problem. You know, I can do this. And so many times I would go into Compton and study the Bible with young women because I felt like it was my mission, and I loved it. And one mom one day came home from work while I was studying the Bible with her daughter, and she said to me, she goes, what are you doing here? I go, oh, I'm teaching your daughter the Bible. You know, how bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and all happy. And she looked at me, she goes, don't ever come here again. And I was like, why? She goes, have you seen you? <laughs> you don't belong here. <laughs> And I thought, okay, um, I'm sorry. She goes, yeah, it's dangerous for you to be here. You shouldn't be here. And I thought, I feel really protected by God, so I'm going to do it. Um, and that was the mission, kind of like what Lena was sharing earlier. Like, we were just so excited to do anything for God. And um, eight months later, we were asked to quit our jobs, train in the ministry, and move to what was called our AMS ministry at that time. And so, of course, we gladly did that. And it was in, uh, we lived in Marina del Rey initially, then we moved to Playa del Rey and landed there for a while. Um, soon after that, we had our first child, our son Kyle, who's 22 now. Um, and we, um, I would say four years after that, God um, moved us to a little town, not a little town, it's big, uh, in the Inland Empire called Riverside. Now, being a native of California, I didn't even know where Riverside was. And that was like, oh my gosh, where are we going? And uh, many of our friends on this side of town would joke with us and say, is there a Target out there? I'm like, come on, you guys. It's California. Of course there's a Target. There's even a Walmart. You should come. <laughs> um, but it was awesome. It was so much, um, you know, God really protected that journey out there. Um, we were there for four years and we moved to Rancho Cucamonga where we, um, for the most part, spent um, our lives as of late. Um, we had our daughter out there. She's amazing. She's here today. She's 18. Um, and uh, anyhow, we moved, uh, well, okay, so we live in Rancho Cucamonga at that time. Loved it there. Suburbia, community, amazing relationships, got to watch our kids grow up. I didn't get to go to the same school in elementary school or junior high, but I got to provide that for my kids, and I felt very fortunate to do that. Um, and yet, you know, on the mission. Well, when you've been in a community for a long time, you get, you get comfortable, and you settle in, and you build the family, and you think this is what it's really about. And I started to really wane in my uh, zeal for the mission, even though I felt internally like, gosh, I need to be on this and I want to be on this. And I just don't know how to do it here because I got so comfortable. And no matter what, I, I tried to reinvent myself many times and it just wasn't working. And I felt like God really called us and put on our hearts to open ourselves up. And previous to that, I would say five years earlier, God put it on our hearts as well. And we had like three different opportunities to move and lead other churches. And so Steve and I prayed and we fasted. And we felt at the end of that, God really closed our hearts off to open ourselves up for that. And it's interesting how the Spirit works because within two months of us deciding we're not going to open ourselves up to any other place, we got permanent guardianship of my nephew. And if we hadn't uh, made that decision and moved, we wouldn't have been able to take him into our home because you can't take an underage child out of the state that doesn't belong to you. And so we really saw how God had really closed those doors for a greater purpose. And so now, fast forward, um, coming here, really it was God working again because in a conference in Panama, We've known Ken and Lena um, just from a distance, not relationally at all. And at this conference, we kept running into him. God just kept putting us together, like in the elevator or, you know, on the way to a class or whatever it was. And conversations just started to happen. And 
we started to pray and fast again. And God just every step of the way really made it clear that this was the journey, this is the path, this is where we should be here with you guys. And we're so grateful that he did that. This last year, honestly, has really been a great victory and a great challenge for our family. Um, Moving, I thought it wouldn't be hard coming back to where we started. But this part of town has changed dramatically. Um, There's so many more people. Traffic Mm. is a cost. You know, you have to really map your day out Mm. in order to get anywhere. Mm. It's incredible. And then also um, the cost of living. You know, it, it really has been a great sacrifice and challenge, but yet with so many amazing blessings. And so we are so grateful. I just wanted to share those things with you because I don't want you to think that life is always just a bed of roses. Uh, When you serve Jesus, it is a lot of ups and downs and a lot of twists and turns, but it's all worth it no matter what. Um, So anyhow, very, very grateful. Thanks, baby. Kathy, I wanted to add that. We all have a journey. Every one of us is going through a journey. And um, I don't think I need this. I can roam the stage. Um, And Exodus is a journey of God's people from really the early days when God chose to reveal himself to a lost world. And we're going to study through this for the next three months. It's going to be an awesome time to study. So many lessons are going to come out of it. But really, Exodus is a foundational story of deliverance. And it's about going from captivity to a new place, coming out of oppression to where you get a covenant and you belong to something really special. All of us can relate to being captive, uh, to having things feel oppressive in our life. Interestingly, those of us who belong to Jesus have been freed in every way a person can be freed. And all of us at one point in life are captive. And so the story of the Israelites being physically captive to the Egyptians really is a model for your individual life. And as we see the story and the breadth of of all the lessons to this nation, they apply to your own walk with God. So to kind of give us a little overview and kind of set the tone, I want to show you guys a little video from a group called The Bible Project. You guys ever seen some of their videos? Very uh, accurate stuff. I love how they present it. And I thought it'd be a good kickoff. They're going to do an overview, just a quick visual and, and audio overview of the first 18 chapters of Exodus. And then I really have one point for us today that we'll kind of dig into. But let's go ahead and turn the video on at this time and watch the Bible Project to kind of whet our appetite for the book of Exodus. All right. So you get a little, a little taste of really what was going on. There's a lot, a lot of meat in there. And if you haven't ever read it, I want to urge you, open up your Bible and start reading. It's, it's just incredible, the stuff you're going to see in there. Uh, every page is filled with really uh, interesting stories. And all our principles that we're going to dig into, they're going to help us grow in our own walk with God. So today, the point and the title of today's lesson, our, our series will be called From Captivity to Covenant. But today we're going to call it A People Belonging to God. And I want to begin in verse uh, chapter 19. You can just look right there on the screen where this is sort of picking up from where the video left off. We find that God summarizes really what he has done for the Israelites. And he says, he says right there, this thing's on fast forward for some reason. It says, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Basically saying, hey, I'm the one that carried you on eagle's wings and saved you and brought you out. And he says, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured people. And we find that as we fast forward into the New Testament, the Apostle Peter, as he's writing the book of 1 Peter, quotes a, a verse, or he, 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 uh, he writes, and of course he's, he's actually referencing back to this very verse in 1 Peter chapter 2. And I want you guys to see, oh, my, my bad there. 1 Peter chapter 2, we see a verse that many of us are very familiar with, where he says, but you are a chosen people. 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. We are a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. And if there's one thing I want you to take away today, it's that we are called to be a people belonging to God. And the idea of belonging is really important. All of us innately want to belong somewhere. We, uh, we absolutely want to feel like we belong uh, in our family, or we want to feel like the community that we're in, we really belong to. My son, Nathan, that Carrie was talking about, who's uh, my, my wife's sister's son, he, we took him in uh, eight years ago. He's 10 years old now. And he's, he's my son and Carrie's son. We actually are legal guardians of him. And, uh, but, you know, he's called me mom, uh, her mom and me dad. And his, his, his mom, uh, his physical mom is his second mom. So he's got two moms. He's like, I got two moms. That's great. I said, you do. And you, you have more dads, too. And, you know, you're going to see that's not, that's not unusual. But I'm for sure your dad. But then recently he went and got himself a little book. He was at school and he got a, a, a book on adoption. And his friends were like, why are you getting that? He says, I want to read about it. I want to understand it. And it shared all the different types of, of relationships that children can have within our culture today. It's very pluralistic. And there's all kinds of relationships. And he was desiring to know how he belonged. You know, what's great is Carrie's mom's lived with us for 15 years. Lynn, she's awesome. That's his grandma. Grandma is always grandma, whether, you know, his biological mom is with us or, or, or mommy that takes care of him is with us. Grandma's always grandma. And he knows he belongs. And, you know, he read it and he's like, I feel great. I mean, you know, he's super well adjusted. Awesome kid. I love him with all my heart. But it, it highlights how each of us also want to know that we belong. This morning, as you consider your relationship with God, we have to evaluate how do we feel about belonging to God. You know, the idea of belonging, the idea of being a member uh, is something that really comes from Christianity. We are a people belonging to God. And, you know, the idea of membership uh, arises from the Hebrew word that really means to mold, to create or to knead out of a whole so that you are part of a body. And sadly, today, membership in different clubs has very little meaning. Todd was referencing the, in the welcome of how we could be a, a member of Vaughn's Club or a member of Ralph's Club or a member of Costco. And yet it doesn't mean a whole lot. It means you can use your card to get in or get a discount. Sadly, sometimes membership and belonging to a church means you showed up on Sunday. And yet I want us to consider that's not real membership in a family. You know, the Bible talks about how the family of God is like a body. We are the body of Christ. And can you imagine a human body that just had like the kidney inserted inside the body cavity, but wasn't connected by the blood vessels and the sinews and, and all, the, and all the, the nerve cells and all the connections? It would, it would just sit inside the body and you know it would die and the body would die of sepsis, right? You, you'd die from that. It won't work. In the same way, for us to belong to God's family, we must be interconnected through relationship and friendship and discipleship and surrender and ultimately by the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But we need connections. As a church, I want to put before us that how people integrate into the West Side Church needs to be thought of like this. I want us to consider this, this model right here. Belong, believe, become. Which is really an inversion of a lot of churches and even our historical roots as churches of Christ where we really want to convict people of the right thinking, the right doctrine, the right way to become a Christian, repentance and baptism and devotion, right? We think in terms of appealing to the mind. But I want to put before us as a congregation, and I want us to instill this in how we go about representing Jesus. The first move is the move that people feel like they belong. Amen? Amen? That everyone needs to know they belong. There's an unconditional love. The first move of Christ was to come from heaven to earth and say, I will step out and make you feel like you belong. Right. So there's an initiation. There's a welcome. There's a hospitality that needs to define our fellowship. Amen. We belong. Then, yes, when we feel that safety, 
we open our mind to begin to believe and understand. We, we have a study series. If you're visiting today, welcome. We want everyone to have a deep conviction on the basics of Christianity. We call it the First Step Bible Study Series. And guess what? We don't offer a class on the material unless it's a class on how to teach it. Because the class is offered by you. You offer it to your neighbors one by one. That's how membership in our church is created. You feel loved, you feel like you belong, you're connected relationally, and then you get into these deep foundational Bible studies or on our website, you can pull them up, but we need to teach them to one another and to our neighbors. But they won't believe it until they see and feel the acceptance of unconditional love. You guys with me? And then they become what God intends for them to become. And I want that to be a movement in our church. It's the way we integrate in the West Side Church. You guys, you guys behind that? Now with that, there's this other thing. Belonging and covenant. Covenant goes hand in hand with belonging. Yes, God made a move to come down and save the world. The new covenant is the greatest. God is the greatest at making covenants. And a covenant is really an agreement. It's agreement that he says, and we had read it earlier, he said, if you, if you hold to my covenant and, and obey me, you will be my own treasured possession. You'll be mine. We all make these kind of agreements. And you know, when you feel accepted and loved, yes, there's a, a sense of belonging. But true belonging occurs when you make a commitment. In Carrie and I's marriage... I fell for her quite early. I wanted to clean her up in the waters of baptism. I was happy that she got right with God. But we didn't belong to each other until we made a commitment to each other. We made the marriage vows to each other and we belonged. In the same way, God has always put out there some covenants for his people. If you know the Old Testament a little bit, the most famous one is in Genesis 12, where he tells this guy named Abraham, and he's going to use Abraham to reveal his presence to the whole world. And he sees Abraham as a man of faith. And he says, Abraham, get up, leave your, your family, your homeland, and go to where I'm going to show you. That's your part. That's, that's what I'm calling you. That's the commitment I'm asking for. And if you do that, I will make you, even though he didn't have any kids at that time, into a great nation. In fact, I will make you the greatest nation. And all people on earth will be blessed through your faith if you accept this covenant. And that's the Abrahamic covenant that really kicked off the, the, most of the Bible and, and, and can be found in every chapter. It's all in there. Well, today we live in the time of what's known as the new covenant, which is God said, all right, here's my plan. I know that ultimately nobody's going to be able to really follow all the things that God asks. So I'm going to send my son. He's going to die for the human race. And he's going to live and show them, here's the way to live while you're here. But I'm going to do whatever it takes to show them I love them. And the covenant he makes with us is if you'll simply accept that he has given his life for us. And accepting it means more than intellectually saying, oh, okay, I believe it. It means to say, all right, I'm in. I'm in. I'm on your team. I'm surrendered to you. Jesus died for me, so I will die for him. So the covenant he makes is, hey, give your life to me and I will give you blessings that cannot even be described. That's the new covenant that we've all, if you're here today and you're a member of the church, you've made a commitment to that. If you're here and you're a Christian and you, you understand that, maybe you're here today and you haven't really fully comprehended it. Maybe there's a sense you're, you're not ready to make the commitment. God wants you to feel like you belong. But the reality is you won't fully belong until you accept the covenant. And there's some commitment involved in the covenant. In the new covenant, the promises are enormous. So many promises. Promises, uh, we could do 10 weeks of series on the promises of Jesus. I challenge you to study that out. But the scriptures teach that of all the promises, they are yes in Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says they are yes. And, and I, I'm not going to go through them all. But ultimately there's eternal life. There's hope. There's forgiveness. Right? There's this incredible mission that we get to enjoy. Uh, there's the promise of brothers and sisters. A hundred times what we thought. But with it, persecutions and suffering. Yes, there is challenges. God doesn't promise your life's going to be without suffering if you commit to him. But here's what I want to do. I want to talk to you guys about do you really want to belong? If you want to belong, you're going to have to make a commitment and trust that God is faithful. At the end of the day, God is always faithful. 
So I don't want to end today without reading a little bit of chapter 1 of Exodus. So turn with me or scroll down. I purposely didn't put it on the screen. I want you to look in Exodus chapter 1, verse 15. So scroll down in your, on your phone or pull out your hard... Who's got a hard copy Bible with them today? All right, I like it, I like it. All right, who uses their phone as their Bible? If you download our app, we usually a lot of times... Well, oftentimes, I don't know if it happened today because we had a little technical thing, but we get the scripture references right in our app. So you can download the Westside Church app. All right, so let's read Exodus chapter 1, verse 15. And I want to demonstrate to you, here's just another of the hundreds of examples of God's faithfulness. Because in this covenant, I believe a lot of times we don't commit because we don't trust he'll be faithful. Look here in verse 15 of Exodus chapter 1. It says, The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, When you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. See, we already covered in the Bible project that the the Pharaoh is probably the worst character in the whole Bible. He no longer knew the history of the Israelites. And he felt threatened by this nation that was growing. And he thought maybe if a war happened that they would side with the other, other people. And so he absolutely had fear. He was living by fear. And so he institutes this terrible calling to kill the little boys. Imagine a nation living where you knew if you get pregnant and you have a boy, he's going to be killed. That's the world that Moses came into, and we'll cover that next week. But that's an evil thing. And he tells the midwives, okay, if it's a girl, let her live, or a boy, kill him. But in verse 17, the midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, they trusted the covenant. He gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile. But let every girl live. If the midwives wouldn't solve it, no problem. We're going to throw the boys. And so we're going to get into that more. I want you to see what an incredible example. The midwives trusted God. And a lot of us, we feel insecure. We feel, I know for a fact, we need the new covenant because we don't always feel like we match up. We all, well, we can be accused, right? The accuser is accusing us night and day. And and I want us to break through that. The, The cross gives us hope for that, to overcome that. But these midwives had fear of death if they didn't obey the Egyptian king. He was an evil king. He certainly would have killed them. But they stood their ground and said, no, we're going to do what is right in the eyes of God. Church, I think a lot of us, we, we, we're insecure emotionally. We're insecure uh, about who we are, about our life, about our value, about uh, who are we making something of ourselves. And at the end of the day, a lot of it boils down to we we really have a hard time trusting God. We're in church. We come to church all the time. But we don't trust that he will follow through with his word. Belonging and covenant go hand in hand. We belong because God is faithful. But the question for you is, will you be faithful even when it hurts to God? I want to call us as a church here on the west side to renew our covenant with God. I want to call on all of us to be faithful to God. And part of that is I want you to understand that there's a vision for our church. Just as God has a vision for your individual life, there's a vision for our church. The west side vision, what is it? We as a staff have gathered over the last couple months And we brainstormed and we've prayed and we've really on our hearts asked God, show us what should we be known for? As a family, what are we going to be known for? And here's what surfaced. Here's what really kind of surfaced in terms of the main focus of our church. Two things. We're going to be a church known for spiritual growth and transformation. When you connect in the West Side Church, you will not remain stuck. Now, I know a lot of us say, oh, I've been stuck. Well, we're not, we're, we're not okay with that. We want people to grow. 
spiritually, emotionally, out of addiction, out of depression, out of despair, out of hopelessness, out of a sense that life is not worth anything, there is hope in Jesus. We want the church to be known for deep relationships that mentor and train and disciple and help everybody feel like they're not stuck in the same place they were the year before. We believe we're a church where God's understanding is imparted to us through deep study of the Bible, where people love opening the Bible, where lots of us are bringing our hard copy Bibles or our tablets or our phones, and we love multiple versions of the Bible and digging in and getting deep into the Word of God. We want to be known as a church that raises up the young and the old to become leaders in the kingdom of God that you are growing. Westside Church will be known as a place that is distinct. It's not just another church. It's a church that's integrated and it's built one by one. And if you come here, you're going to grow. And we're going to impact all kinds of people on the west side of Los Angeles. I'm super grateful for sort of the unique aspect of having, you know, the, the Hollywood studios here. And if you look at the little uh, crest right above my head, it says the heart of Screenland. And we started a little ministry called the Screenland Ministry to reach out to people in the entertainment industry. And right now it's a mustard seed. If you're dreaming about being a part of that, talk to Oscar or me. We want to expand it. We want to see it hit the influence music, entertainment, movie production. We want to use the gifts that God has given us. And we're in the hotbed of that going on in our community. It's not okay for us to sit by and not make a difference in that area. I love that we have Silicon Beach down the street, right? Technology is just advancing. Innovation. We want to be known as a church that innovates. We try new things. We're not stuck in the same way. And we influence people. I know on the, the third, uh, in two weeks from now, we're going to have a special Silicon Beach uh, uh, themed worship service. And the Silicon Beach ministry is going to reach out to all their coworkers and people involved in that. We want to be a church that's growing. Not only are we going to grow spiritually, transforming, but we want to grow geographically as a church. We want to expand. If you look at the west side right there, you know, I, I kind of, to get it fit, I had to cut out Malibu. Malibu's actually on the original map right there because we got our Malibu students here, which I'm fired up about. But there's about 25 to 27 uh, uh, different maps, give you a number, uh, different numbers, uh, of neighborhoods and districts on the west side. We're only in about 10 in terms of having an actual neighborhood Bible study in certain areas. Um, the reality is many of us live down in the Culver City, Inglewood, Westchester. You know, we're kind of all centered around the same area. And my vision and the vision of the staff is that we're going to expand. And, and there's going to be a call for us to start Bible talks. I, I know a couple of the single households just started back up in Westwood. Uh, you know, there's like 60,000 people living in Westwood. And they're not all college students, although there are a lot. And we need to expand there. You know, there's 85,000 people that live in Santa Monica. And we don't have a Bible talk taking place in Santa Monica. And we need to. Uh, we need to see Pacific Palisades and the Mid-Cities area and so many other areas of the West Side saturated with family groups and Bible talks, campus, singles, marrieds, influencing and changing our society. We're a church that's going to grow spiritually, but also we're going to expand. And God is calling you to that. Amen. I promise we're committed to it. What I want to ask of you is, will you commit to the covenant so that you belong? Will you commit? And here's the covenant. It's nothing new. The West Side Covenant is really something all of us that became disciples already agreed to. We all said, yes, Jesus is my Lord. I'm committed to be a disciple of Jesus and be a part of discipleship and be trained and have people in my life and to be in other people's lives. I'm committed to be a part of a small group so that I can live out the one another lifestyle. You know, the reality is no one can live out the one another lifestyle with 300 people every day. But you can live out God's calling in a small family group with 10, 15 people that you can know their life. And that's a calling that we have. It's an expectation. We want everyone in our church to be tied in, not just showing up, but integrated relationally into a small group. And that doesn't mean that you're stuck in that small group forever. We're a mature family. There might be times for us to shift family groups. We want to work together as a team and as a staff with the fellowship. This is a family that works together. And we want everyone to find a place where they belong. 
meetings of the body. It's not just Sunday service. We, we have midweeks every other week. We have retreats. There's singles elevate events. There's campus midweeks, campus devos. We do a lot of stuff. Why? Because we need each other. And being together strengthens us. And there's a lot of stuff we're trying to do to advance the gospel. And we're committed to that. Evangelism and outreach is a part of every Christian's life. Disciples make disciples. And last, we all sacrifice for the mission of God. And yes, that means financially. We put God first in our heart and it comes out in the way we live our life. Church, I want to ask all of us to 2020 to renew your covenant. Why? Because God has said we are a people belonging to him. Amen. I love you guys. Let's have an incredible 2020. Amen.